everybody. Welcome to the Elevate Talk Show, season two. I am your host, Deanna Johnson Cawthon. And I'm your co-host, Adriana Cawthon, and we're the mother-daughter talk show that wants to elevate your family. Now, if you haven't done so already, please take a second to subscribe to the Elevate Talk Show so that you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes. That's right, that's right. And today, we uh, have a great episode planned for you. In our Around the Town segment, we are going to take you to Sweet uh, Water Creek State Park in Lithia Springs, Georgia. Uh, and so you don't want to miss our adventures there. Also, uh, during our In the Spotlight segment, we're going to be talking with um, a group facilitator for NAMI. NAMI is the National Alliance of Mental Illness. We're going to be talking with Diane Helpman, who is a group facilitator. And she's going to take us through um, what NAMI does and what they do to support families who have loved ones with a mental illness. And finally, in our how-to segment, Adrienne and I thought it would be a good idea since kids are going back to school to talk about walking and biking safety for your kids as they go back and forth to school. So a great episode planned for you. And while we're on the subject of kids walking to school, we want you to answer a question for us in the comment section on the YouTube channel. Would you be or how comfortable are you with letting your kids walk or cycle back and forth to school? So take a moment and answer that question for us in the comment section of our YouTube page. Now, before we go any further, Adriana uh, and I are going to give you an update on our um Stepping into summer challenge. Adriana, can you fill people in about that in case they don't know what we were doing this summer? Yes, yeah, so for the past eight weeks, my mom and I have been doing the Stepping Into Summer Exercise Challenge, mm -hmm. and we've been competing against each other to see who could get the most steps in uh, in the eight week period. <laughs> yes. So today, um, today is the final results day. Yes, right. We've got our final results, and we're going to see who has the largest grand total over the entire eight weeks. That's right. Now, and to be, um, uh, to be honest, we don't know who has the final, um, we haven't looked at the final number, so we don't know uh, who exactly has won, although I have an idea of who may have won. But we're going to open these numbers now to see. Okay. Ready? Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. What's your number, Adriana? So I have 596,534 steps. And I have 479,358 steps, which means that Adriana has won, and I am a good sport. I'm going to shake her hand. <laughs> you, you, that that doesn't seem like a good sport. I'm going to tell you something. I had some malfunctions with my Fitbit, okay? It's not my fault that you didn't buy a better Fitbit. You know what? You have uh, no sympathy for me. I don't. Okay. Well, now that that's been established. Um, but you know what I say to this? You know what I say to this? We are both winners. We are both winners because we both stepped up. And we increased our exercise, and as a result, I am happy to report have lost 12 pounds over the last several weeks, especially since I added um, intermittent fasting in. So I feel like there are no losers here. What do you think about that? Yes, that makes you feel better. <laughs> wow. You see what she does? You see what I have to live with, folks? You feel my pain? Okay. Anyway, um, it was a good challenge. It was fun. Yeah. What was the best thing about it for you? Well, for me, I mean, I don't know if I lost any weight. I'm right. not you brave enough to step on a scale. Okay, but, you do all that. Um, yeah, I think that being outside and moving has really helped me to de-stress a lot. Yeah, yeah. Just getting, for me, like I said, beyond the 12 pounds that I lost, but just being in the sun and feeling, you know, um, you know, the, the, the fresh air, breathing all of that in. I don't know how fresh it is, but being in the air. Uh, and so, uh, was just good for me. I like being outside, so it was a great, 
Um, it was just great to, to be active and to be outside and soak up the vitamin D. So, um, yeah, all, all uh, joking aside, I think it was just, it was we really both won. Yeah. Yeah, so with that being said, we're going to take our first break, but don't go away. We'll be right back. Well, we are back and we're getting ready to uh, show you our In the Spotlight interview. Today's guest uh, will be Diane Hiltman. Diane Hiltman uh, has lived in the Atlanta area for 40 years. Uh, she's been a nurse and a nurse midwife and a nurse educator. Diane became deeply uh, interested in mental health issues when uh, close family members were diagnosed with bipolar disorder. She currently serves as the president of NAMI, um, which is, stands for the National Alliance of Mental Illness. She's the NAMI DeKalb uh, president, and she's the chair of Region 3 uh, Advisory Council for the Georgia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. And so she's going to be talking to us about what NAMI does and how they help families who have loved ones with mental illnesses. So take a look at my interview with Diane Hillman. Well, welcome to our show, Diane. It is a pleasure to have you here. And so let's get right into it. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about NAMI? Uh, first of all, what that stands for and how you got involved with the organization. Sure. Uh, NAMI, N-A-M-I, stands for National Alliance of, on Mental Illness. Mm -hmm. um, the organization began oh, in the 70s, so a good 50 years ago, wow. by a group of mothers in Wisconsin who were concerned about providing uh, appropriate support for loved ones they had uh, who lived with mental illness and they didn't know what to do best mm -hmm. for their loved ones. So support groups started and over these 50 years uh, NAMI is now in all 50 states wow. uh, in the United States. That's what now so how did you become involved? I'm interested in the backstory of, uh, of your personal backstory. Sure. Um, you know, the interesting thing is to me is I went to nursing school. I'm a, I was a nurse and, and a nurse midwife. So I had some uh, book learning about psychology and psychiatry, but it's extremely different when it's somebody up close to you yes. that needs your support. Yes. So we have two sons and uh, one of them became seriously mentally ill at a typical point for many people, which is late adolescence, early teenage years. That's real common. Mm -hmm. And when my son became ill, I discovered I didn't know how best to help him. Mm -hmm. And um, I stumbled around for a couple of years and uh, tried to treat him like uh, a, a, a teenager, mm -hmm. uh, like you parent a regular teenager, and that wasn't working so well. Right. And finally, about five years into his illness, um, somebody mentioned NAMI to me. Mm -hmm. And I, I mourn those five years mm -hmm. that we stumbled around yeah. without knowing what we were doing. Yeah. And, and uh, once we found out about NAMI and uh, got involved, uh, our ability, my husband and my ability to support our son yes. appropriately, vastly improved. One of the things I adore about NAMI is they tell us as family members that it's very important mm -hmm. for us to take care of ourselves absolutely well so that we can take care yes. or help take care of yes, our loved ones. Yeah. That's all the quilting things you'll see behind oh, me. I, I, I love have, it. I make myself have a little bit of fun every day. Yes, I love that. <laughs> I, I, I so understand what you're talking about since we, you know, too have a loved one with who's suffering from a mental illness. And we, uh -huh. have, we make sure, my husband and I, that we take some time out regularly usually every day to do what we need to do for ourselves so you are so right and i think people who might be listening to this 
um, need to really understand that that is such an important thing to do. Let me ask you a question um, so we can put this out there to our viewers. Who does NAMI serve? Who is NAMI for? NAMI is for people who live with a serious mental illness mm -hmm. and the family who loves them. Right. And family is defined very loosely. It's That's right. whoever is significant. It's not about blood or legal kin necessarily at okay. all. For us, NAMI provided um, something for my husband and me. Yes. And something for our loved ones. Sure. So it was something we could share easily. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't mean that, that they group us all together necessarily, no. but there are classes about mental illness mm -hmm. for family members mm -hmm. and for the person who lives with mental illness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there's ongoing mm -hmm. support uh, groups mm -hmm. every week for family members and for the persons who live with mental illness. So wow. uh, yes. it, it helps that we as a family share kind of the same point of view and we're hearing the same things. And that's, so um, yeah, it's very holistic. It is holistic and it's, and it's inclusive for the whole family so mm -hmm. that you don't have to go to separate places to yeah. find yeah. the support and education that we all need. Yeah. Um, that's One of the great. things that um, that I learned in the first class I took with NAMI, uh, again, five years into our son's illness, mm -hmm. was the simple maxim that mental illness is a physical illness of the brain. Wow. A physical illness of the brain. Yes. Nothing more. Wow nothing less wow meaning meaning it's not an absence of self-will right it's not a lack of faith right relationship to god or going right. to church enough or praying enough right. it's not um bad parenting right it's not just a stubborn willful person who's uh manipulating everybody Right, right. It's none of those. Right. It's a physical illness of the brain. Mm -hmm. It can't be cured, mm -hmm. but it can be treated, mm -hmm. and people can mm -hmm. have a very satisfying life. Yes, I love that. I love that you break that down. I think that is so important for people to hear, and I think even um, with me having been in NAMI and having done some of our own research on mental health, I think for me to hear this even now is um, very, um, it continues to enlighten me and just confirm what I've been learning. And I think that um, we would never question things if this was, if a person was sick with, let's say heart disease or yes. if they had diabetes, or if there was some sort of yes. gastrointestinal thing going wrong, we, there wouldn't yes. be all these moral, um, what do you call, things attributed to it. But somehow when it comes to the brain, we, we, it, it, we, there's all this judgment. And I think it's really important for people to hear what you just said, that it, it's, the brain is not working well. Yes, yes. Let me ask you a question. Can you... Um, talk and tell my audience about some of the specific programs um, and resources th that are available. One in particular that I am interested in is the family to family. Um, I think it's a Education class. class. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. Um, first, I'd like to give everybody the web addresses yes. so that right. they can look this up on any level. So you want to go to mm -hmm. NAMI.org, mm -hmm. NAMI.org. That's the national website. There's mm -hmm. lots of information yes. on there, yes. Yes. Uh, fact sheets that you can print off and make available to others. Then there's NAMI GA, which is for Georgia, NAMI, N A M I G A dot org. Mm -hmm. That's our state organization. Right. There's lots of resources there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if you're specifically interested in any particular local affiliate, you just, mm -hmm. most everybody has the formula N A M I and then the county. 
right. regions. That's right. And I'll um, make that and, available on the screen too. Yes. And on all those sites, you can find information about what we call the four signature programs of NAMI. Mm -hmm. Now, NAMI does a lot more than this, but this is the core foundation. Right. First off, everything is no cost. We, we raise money to cover the cost, but when somebody comes to us in crisis, there's no charge. Wow. Second, most everything is done by volunteers. There's mm -hmm. very few paid people in the organization, mm -hmm. but that's really on purpose. NAMI is um, all the classes and support programs are taught and led by what we call persons with lived experience. Sure. So um, the, if you think of it as a four-way box, mm -hmm. education mm -hmm. and support, family and loved one. Mm -hmm. So there's a class for families, sure. eight weeks long, to learn about just the basics of mental illness. Mm. There's a similar class that persons who live with mental illness mm -hmm. can take right. called peer to peer. In both cases, those are led by or taught by mm -hmm. people who've walked in those shoes. Right. Um, wow, um, that's great. And so I, we appreciate your time and we will you. have you back. Thank you so much for being with us today. Indeed. Have Indeed. a blessed, Indeed. have a very, have a blessed day. Alrighty, bye, Deanna. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, don't go away. We will be right back after this short break. Hello, and welcome back to The Elevate Show. And today, we're going to be talking about walking and biking safety for kids. Yes, um, with kids going back to school in person, we thought that this would be a great time to talk about uh, safety measures as children, some who walk and bike, go back and forth uh, from home to school, school to home. Um, and so this is an, um, a particular topic that's near and dear to my heart, not just because I have um, I raise children and have grandchildren who are in school, but also because years ago I used to be a school crossing guard and I've seen some pretty scary things. So I think it's important that um, this is these tips or something that we, we talk about and just so we can make things safer for our children as they go back and forth to school. So with that being said, um, let's share a few tips uh, about walking and biking safety. I know you have uh, one that you want to share. Yes, so safety tip number one is always walk on a sidewalk or walking path if possible. Mm -hmm. If you're walking in a, down a street that has no sidewalks on it, uh, make sure that you walk facing traffic as far to the left as possible mm -hmm. so that you can get away to a passing car if you need to. Right, and stop for a second there. I think it's important to flesh that out. I think um, that whole idea of, of, of walking toward the traffic why is it important to walk with the um, walk toward the traffic looking at the traffic well it's really important to do that because um, if you're facing the traffic you're able to see what's coming towards yeah. you and if there's a car coming towards you um, you're you'll be able to jump out of sure, the way sure but if you're if the traffic is behind you you won't see that and with some of the newer cars mm -hmm. being very quiet yeah, you may you not be able hear to hear them either so yes, it's yes. not safe to walk That's uh, right. with you're back to the traffic. Absolutely. And then you had one more point you wanted to make on this topic. So um, it's a good idea if you're a parent mm -hmm. to take your kids for a walk and demonstrate yeah. your safety tips to them so that right. they know exactly what you're talking about. Right, right. Because some, if you just tell them it's abstract and yeah. they may not know how to actually do it in real life. That's exactly right. And so it's good to just literally walk it out with them. Yeah. That's a great idea. Well, um, safety tip number two would be uh, to tell your children uh, and to make sure that they understand that it's important that they don't 
be distracted. And this is a day and age where we're all very distracted, both children and adults alike, don't you think? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and now with kids having smartphones much younger, um, I mean, I've seen seven and eight year olds with smartphones. The, the temptation would be to be on your phone, but they we need to teach them not to be distracted while they're walking home or uh, from school or walking to school. Um, they need to put their phones away because the chances of them getting hurt um, when they're distracted definitely goes up, don't you think? Yeah, it goes way up. Definitely goes up. So let's get another tip, another safety tip. So tip number three is to be safe while crossing the street. Mm -hmm. It's really important to look both ways before crossing. Mm -hmm. um, you should tell your kids that they should always walk in a crosswalk, even if it means walking a little further to cross in a designated crossing area. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that's something we have seen people not do. It's the, I think the temptation is just just kind of scoot across the street and not walk down a little ways to the crosswalk. Yeah, I mean, it's really tempting, especially if the place you're getting to is right in front of you. But right. you should always uh, cross in a crosswalk because mm -hmm. that's the safe thing to do. Right, right. And um, kids under 10 should always cross the street with an adult. Um, since they haven't developed the timing and spatial reasoning skills yeah. um, to safely move across the street and avoid cars. That's right. We That hasn't developed yet, so they need an adult to guide them across. Yeah. Very good, very good. Um, tip number four uh, would be to make sure that you can see and be seen by others. I remember discussing this with my husband one day, one evening, when we were driving home from somewhere, and um, the person, um, we, you know, it was darker. It wasn't dark, dark, but it was darker. And just as he was rounding the bend, there was a person that was just walking on the street. There wasn't any sidewalk, and they were wearing black. Um, and we fortunately saw them at the last moment, but it was really close. So I think it's, and so adults need to remember this too, but we really want to emphasize this with our children. Make sure that you can see others and that you can be seen by others. It's very important that, um, our children, uh, have a way to see when they're walking or riding their bikes home from school, especially during foggy foggy or inclement weather, rainy weather. Also, we need to make sure that our children are wearing reflective clothing, jacket, jackets, vests, um, backpacks, um, or carry or have some sort of bike light. Um, my husband cycles. He's got bike lights front, back, up, down, middle, everything. Uh, and so that will help them see the path a little bit better. So make sure they have that reflective gear on. Um, and it's not that expensive. I mean, you can order stuff pretty cheaply on Amazon. Yeah. So um, that's a really important thing, taking those little extra measures. What's another point? So here's safety tip number five. Uh, practice cycling safety. Mm -hmm. So kids who ride their bikes to and from school need to ra know the rules of the road. Mm -hmm. If they're riding the bi their bikes on the street, they need to follow all of the same rules as the cars follow, including uh, riding in the same direction as traffic mm -hmm. and stopping at stop signs and stop lights and re yielding to pedestrians. That's right. Now in uh, in some states, um, children 12 and under are allowed to ride their bikes on the sidewalk, but mm -hmm. you need to check your local ordinances yes. to see if this is the case in your area. That's right, that's right. And our final tip in this segment is to always wear a helmet. Always. Um, in most states, it's the law to wear a helmet when you are riding a bike, but even if it isn't, it's still really important um, as mm -hmm. a safety rule. Yeah, it could save your life or your child's life, so make sure to wear a helmet. We hope that these tips will help to you and to your children and that they'll make um, their uh, traveling back and forth to school whether they be walking or cycling just a little bit safe safer so don't go away but we'll be right back uh, today in our around the town segment we will be taking you to Sweetwater Creek State Park in Lithia Springs, Georgia. Our family uh, visited there last summer, had a great time, got to see some really um, 
uh, terrific things at the park, unique and terrific things, as you'll see in the segment. Do you remember a uh, little trip there? Yes, I remember. We had a great time, uh -huh. and we brought our dog, Carolina, yeah. and she loved it. She had a great time. Wonderful. So stay with us as we take our adventures to Sweetwater Creek State Park in Lithia Springs. This week's Around the Town takes us to Sweetwater Creek State Park in Lithia Springs, Georgia. Our family, along with our dog, Carolina, visited the park last summer and discovered that Sweetwater Creek State Park is a peaceful track of wilderness only minutes from downtown Atlanta. The park offers a wealth of activities and accommodations, including yurts along the lake that can be rented for overnight stays. A wooded trail follows the stream to the ruins of the new Manchester Manufacturing Company, a textile mill burned during the Civil War. Beyond the mill, the trail climbs rocky bluffs to provide views of the beautiful rapids below. The park also features a myriad of trails which wind through field and forest. The 215-acre George Sparks Reservoir is popular for fishing, canoeing, and kayaking. Pedal boats can also be rented. The visitor center features wildlife displays, trail maps, snacks, and a renovated gift shop. A meeting room that seats 40 can be rented for gatherings. The park also features a gateway-style Continental Trust Bridge, which connects two trail systems located on either side of the Sweetwater Creek. The bridge was installed back in 2012 to replace an old bridge that was destroyed in 2009 due to flooding. The lovely lake and the quiet walking trails make Sweetwater Creek State Park the perfect place to visit if you want to get back in touch with nature, and we highly recommend it. For more information about Sweetwater Creek State Park, go to www.georgiastateparks.org backslash Sweetwater Creek. Well, we hope you enjoyed that segment and stay with us. Uh, and we're going to take a little break, but we'll be right back. Well, we're back. And our time together is just about up. But before we go, we want to invite you to share with us something that you do uh, to elevate your life or the lives of the people that you love, be it family members or friends. Is there some hobby that you uh, that you do, that you engage in, that just brings joy to your life and brings joy to the lives of others? Have you lost weight and want to share with us how you made that experience happen? Have you started a, a new business and uh, the business that you've been looking to do, uh, something passionate that you've been looking to do for a long time and now you've been able to get that started? We want to know about it. We want you to tell us about it. And Adriana is going to share with uh, you how you can make that happen. So to share your stories with us, go to the Elevate Talk Show YouTube channel page and subscribe. Then email your stories and picture to mm -hmm. ElevateYTChannel at gmail.com. Very good. Very uh, you good. can also become a friend of the Elevate Facebook page and that will allow you to share your stories and pictures with us there too. Great, great, great. Thank you for sharing that. Also, we want to remind our audience that the Elevate Talk Show... Uh, puts up new episodes each Sunday evening on our YouTube channel. We, you can also catch the show on Comcast 25 at 7 p.m. if you live in DeKalb County, Georgia, or you can go to DeKalb25.com and live stream the show there as well. So thanks for watching, and please remember to take a minute and subscribe to the Elevate Talk Show channel. Yes, and we uh, want to wish you a great week and see you next time. Thanks for joining us. Bye.